According to the Associated Press, this year the U.S. military will be deploying an army brigade, codenamed the Dagger Brigade, to Africa to operate in small teams in 35 countries. The brigade will be under the control of General Carter Ham, head of the U.S. African Command. The official pretext for this move is to, quote, train countries to battle extremists and to give U.S. a ready and trained force to dispatch in Africa if crisis requiring the U.S. military emerge. According to General Ham, mobilizing these forces for active combat would only require an order from Defense Secretary Leon Panetta. This announcement came as France began bombing missions in Mali earlier this year, followed by the deployment of ground troops, again under the pretext of fighting Islamic terrorism. It's important to note here that the government that France is backing was just recently established by the military in Mali, after a military coup which toppled the democratically elected government. The army, which has been accused of engaging in torture and sexual abuse of detainees, still retains real power. According to U.S. Defense Secretary Leon Panetta, the U.S. has been providing intelligence-gathering assistance to the French in Mali. U.K. Special Forces are also involved in the operation. The grand irony here is that on one hand, NATO forces are taking military action against Islamic rebels. On the other hand, they are funding them and arming them in neighboring countries. In Syria, for example, France has openly supported the Syrian rebels in their attempts to destabilize the Syrian government, and has even offered to send the rebels anti-aircraft and heavy artillery. This in spite of German intelligence reports which have revealed that foreign Al-Qaeda extremists have been behind a number of recent atrocities in Syria. These aren't just similar insurgents that are being funded in one country and battled in another. In many cases, they are the very same fighters. Russia's foreign minister Sergei Lavrov was recently quoted as saying, In Mali, France is fighting against those that armed in Libya against Gaddafi's regime, in violation of the UN Security Council arms embargo. To complicate matters, on January 30th, Israel bombed targets in Syria, under the pretext that Syria was sending weapons to its ally Hezbollah in neighboring Lebanon. In spite of this act of overt war, the Syrian government has not retaliated. They understand that any retaliation would be used by NATO to provide the justification for a full-scale invasion. Through all of this, Russia has continued providing weapons to the Syrian government, and has made moves to counter the NATO missile defense shield outpost that was recently established in East Anatolia, Turkey, by building an array of anti-aircraft missiles pointed at Turkey. All of this would seem contradictory and absurd if we take NATO's official explanation at face value, but it makes perfect sense if you understand what's really at stake here. NATO is both funding and attacking Islamic extremists because the instability which results provides a pretext for a military presence. NATO's growing military presence in Africa and in the Middle East only makes sense when viewed as strategic positioning in the build-up to a much larger global conflict. In World War II, Africa, the Middle East, and the Caucasus region were key pivot points which both sides fought to control. Rich in oil, gold, and other key industrial resources, military domination in these areas was a determining factor in the outcome of the conflict. Hitler's invasion of Russia, for example, was driven by his desire to control the vast oil fields of the Caucasus region, the area between the Caspian and Black Seas, which includes Iran and Azerbaijan. Not surprisingly, this region was also highlighted in Zygmunt Brzezinski's book, The Grand Chessboard, which outlined the key regions which must be controlled in order to ensure continued U.S. dominance. Israel and NATO's current attacks in Syria, combined with U.S. sanctions on Iran which are openly geared towards destroying the Iranian economy, are part of a long-term policy of provocation. But what's really at stake in this provocation? Perhaps we should consider this statement by Major General Zhang Zhaozhong, who declared in late 2011 that, quote, China will not hesitate to protect Iran, even with the Third World War. Russia has issued numerous warnings of a similar nature, though the wording is slightly less direct. Rather than taking a step back and reconsidering its policies, the U.S. instead has decided to expand its provocation by including in the 2013 version of the NDAA under Section 1063 an order titled Report on the Capability of Conventional and Nuclear Forces Against Certain Tunnel Sites, which directs the commander of the U.S. Strategic Command to prepare a report assessing the capability of the U.S. military to destroy a network of tunnels in China and the known hardened and deeply buried sites of foreign nations using conventional or nuclear forces. This was in a bill that was released to the public via the Internet and which is available for any country to read, including China. Consider for a moment how you would interpret this if you were in the Chinese government, and you saw the U.S. government issuing a direct order to outline the feasibility of using nuclear weapons to destroy military positions in your country. How might that change the way that you respond to future developments? It should be obvious that such information would encourage China to use nuclear weapons preemptively in the event of a conflict, because they would understand that the U.S. is developing plans to deploy such weapons themselves. For more information as to why this is happening, please watch The Road to World War III. If you want more content like this, please subscribe to this channel, Storm Clouds Gathering, on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash stormcloudsgathering and on Twitter at Collapse Updates. Also, be sure to check out our website at stormcloudsgathering.com.